Hi, everybody. Welcome to SolarWorks for Illinois. I'm Tim Montague, your host, and today is January 29th, 2019. Today we're going to be talking about the Illinois Solar for All program. It's great to have so many people registered for our monthly SolarWorks for Illinois webinar that we do uh, for free here at www.seco.com forward slash solar webinar. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm Tim Montague, and today we're diving into the Solar All, uh, Illinois Solar for All program. This is part of the Future Energy Jobs Act, which is fueling the addition of 2,800 megawatts of distributed generation and utility scale solar in Illinois. This is big news in Illinois, of course, because heretofore we only had between 100 and 200 megawatts in the entire market. So this is going to be a 30-fold increase, and the, uh, the utility scale program has already launched. There's been several reverse auctions for those, and then the distributed generation program, also known as the adjustable block program, or Illinois Shines, is launching tomorrow. So applications for uh, solar renewable energy credits are starting tomorrow in that program. That's been long awaited. Future Energy Jobs Act went into force in the summer of 2017. So anything built uh, after June of 2017 is eligible for that program. And then there are several segments of the program. The Illinois Solar for All is, is one of those. We call that a carve out and we're gonna dive into that with Vito Greco, uh, who's our guest today. And Vito is a senior manager of solar programs at Elevate Energy, a nonprofit dedicated to designing and implementing energy programs that lower costs and protect the environment and ensure the benefits of smart energy reach those who need them most. In his role, Vito is developing strategies that accelerate solar deployment for our most critical institutions, including affordable housing, government, and nonprofit. Vito has provided strategic support for renewables deployment for the city of Chicago, the city of Detroit, Cook County, Illinois, and the Chicago Housing Authority. So pleased to have you on SolarWorks for Illinois. Welcome, Vito. Hi, Tim. Thanks for uh, letting me join. I know you're very busy uh, preparing for the launch of the Illinois Solar for All program, so I really appreciate you taking some time out of your day. And uh, for everybody's um, knowledge, you can go to illinoissfa.com to learn more about the Illinois Solar for All program. There'll be regular updates. Please do sign up for email updates where they'll be making several announcements in the coming months. This is a program that will launch officially, I believe, in April. Is that right, Vito? That's right. <laughs> and what we're going to do today is Vito is going to give us a uh, oh, about a 10, 15 minute overview. I might ask some questions during that and then we'll do uh, a little more Q&A between Vito and I and our audience. So please, um, you can enter your questions through the Zoom uh, app, or uh, we, can, uh, we can do those verbally as well. Uh, so just raise your hand or type in a question as we go along, and hopefully we can get all of your questions answered. Please understand that this program is still, uh, the, the details of the program are still being ironed out. So we won't necessarily have answers to all of your questions, but Vito is of course uh, the horse's mouth. Uh, Elevate Energy has, uh, been assigned to be the program manager for the Solar for All program. So they are knee deep in, in putting this together. So with that, why don't you go ahead, Vito? Sure. Thanks, Tim. So, uh, yeah, thanks for, thanks for um, joining. I thought it would be helpful that we can provide a high-level overview of the program. I think there's probably some initial questions on um, just what the scope of the program is and what uh, the eligibility is. So um, starting with a, a, a few high level things, just to understand the context of Illinois Solar for All. Um, we, we, Tim had talked about the adjustable block program, which officially opens tomorrow, their first blocks. Um, and Illinois Solar for All is in many ways a related program, but it's specifically targets incentives to low income and environmental justice communities. And what it does that through 
um, the higher values of the RECs purchased through the program. So the RECs available for DG and community solar, for instance, an adjustable block, um, you'll see that in Illinois Solar for All, they're gonna be markedly higher. And the idea with that is that those um, benefits can directly be passed on to program participants who would otherwise face barriers for um, taking part in um, the solar industry. There's also some uh, additional pieces to Illinois Solar for All, like job training requirements. Um, if, 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 you're, if those of you are familiar with FIJA, and, and, and you know that the Adjustable Block Program come, comes from that piece of legislation, there's also a lot of other parts to FIJA, including uh, expanded energy efficiency programs, but another piece of that is job training, and specifically solar job training. Um, so there are a number of different programs that have, most of which have already launched, starting to train uh, installers and electricians uh, to do solar work in this uh, quickly growing market. What Illinois Solar for All, All does is it provides minimum requirements that a portion of the installations for Illinois Solar for All have to be done by graduates from these programs or, or similar qualified programs. So um, that'll help accelerate uh, workforce development in solar in Illinois. It's also a grassroots education piece, um, which uh, provides funding to really, it's intended for hard to reach communities across the state to understand that this is coming, to understand how to access the benefits of the program. So we do all we can not to leave any communities behind. Um, so a little bit about the eligibility. Um, and, and as Tim pointed out, this is pretty important. Is we are um, we are about two thirds of the way through the development process for Solar All. We are launching uh, next week the vendor registration, um, and we are essentially a couple of months behind the adjustable block program, and that's by design uh, because we are kind of learning from their process and mirroring their process in many ways. Um, we, so so we, our intention, as Tim mentioned, was to, to launch in April. Um, we'll launch our vendor registration. The point, though, that I wanted to bring up is that there are a number of pieces that have already been proposed uh, and put uh, uh, as uh, put up for public comment, but there's still a number of pieces in the next couple of months that need to go through that. So some of the specifics we may talk about today are currently still under review, but we'll try and give everyone the best uh, indication of where we are if those are not finalized at this point. So the categories of participants are residential property owners, and that includes owners or renters, basically households of 80% or less area median income qualify for this program that are guaranteed a minimum savings and no upfront costs. There's also um, a, a sub-program that targets nonprofit and public facilities uh, in conserving low-income and environmental justice communities. Um, and in general, the program um, has a goal of targeting 25% of all of the incentives to specifically serve environmental justice communities. Thanks for driving, Tim. Get to the next slide. And for those that qualify for Illinois Solar for All, uh, the participants uh, see a minimum of 50% savings um, coming from these projects. Savings is seen in different ways depending on the property type and the participant. But by and large, the high level definition, uh, you can get more information uh, at the website and as we finalize some of the documents. But the high level is that the value that comes from the energy generated from a system, the cost to that participant has to be half or less. So they see essentially 50% savings based on the energy they receive. There's a requirement that there are no upfront costs. So whether they're doing a lease, a system, an, an own system or PPA, um, it has to be structured in a way that the participants see no costs. 
there's a, 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 a little bit more comprehensive vendor management um, with Illinois Sold for All than there is in the adjustable block program. For instance, there are actually on-site inspections that uh, will be required for a portion of installations. Um, and generally ongoing uh, management of, of uh, the installation and vendors. So uh, I thought it'd be helpful to, to sort of uh, show you the different buckets of incentives available through this program. So there are four essentially sub-programs within Illinois Solar for All. The first is distributed generation, which targets residential properties where these income eligible households are. So it could be a single family, there's a two to four unit, uh, and there's five plus units, they all qualify. One to four unit buildings have a higher incentive than five plus unit buildings. Um, uh, all told, that's, uh, we're looking at seven and a half million dollars a year in that sub program. So what you'll see is that the Illinois Solar for All bucket in general of incentives is significantly less than, than the adjustable block program, and as you kind of called it a carve out. Um, yeah, another uh, bucket is the nonprofit public facility, and this is uh, $5 million a year. So uh, again, nonprofit or public agencies um, that are in or connected to low-income communities, and we'll talk a little bit about that. I know that's a question Tim brought up. Uh, that, that information or the eligibility is not finalized, but we can certainly share um, what will be proposed. Same savings and same requirements for no upfront costs for those participants. Community solar is the largest bucket, $12.5 million a year. Um, and that also serves, uh, is intended to serve um, households, uh, income eligible households. Um, same basic savings and cost requirements. The, uh, one of the differences here is that um, it does allow for anchor subscribers. We can talk a little bit more about that later and how that works. The last bucket is uh, community solar pilots, which is right now $5 million a year, but that's actually going to be managed by the Illinois Power Agency's uh, procurement administrator as a competitive procurement similar to the utility and brown scale procurements that are going on. So that's not actually managed uh, in the same way as these other sub-programs. So keep an eye out for that. Um, I thought it'd be helpful for folks to understand some of the differences in the way this program is funded. Um, there's actually two um, categories of funds or two buckets of money. The first comes from the Renewable Energy Resources Fund. And this is currently held by the state of Illinois and originally came from um, alternative compliance payments from areas. Um, and there is, there is essentially this bucket of money that is sitting with the state and the long-term um, renewable resource procurement plan um, allocates $20 million a year from that bucket to Illinois Solar for All. There's also a utility held renewable portfolio, portfolio standard funds, similar to the Just Block program. These are ratepayer funds and the, uh, the same plan allocates $10 million a year or 5% of the RPS funds per plan year, whichever is greater. So currently, we're, uh, our first two years is planning on a $30 million program for Illinois Solar for All. So uh, a couple of important resources to dig in. Um, the first is the, the plan I, I mentioned, the Long-Term Renewable Resource Procurement Plan. It's a mouthful. Um, it, it, we just call it the plan in a lot of our documentation. But that really does provide the framework for both the adjustable block program and Illinois Solar for All. So all the requirements that we need to meet in administering these programs can be found in that plan. Um, so uh, you can look uh, at that plan for more specific details over these coming months uh, as we're preparing to launch the program. And another important place for information, of course, is the Illinois Solar for All website. Right now there is what is essentially a splash page that gives you some bare bones information, but it also gives you the ability to um, sign up for updates and announcements. So I encourage you if you are interested in learning more, uh, to do that and stay aware of the things that are happening. Um, 
Certainly before we close, I can share a few of the upcoming next steps um, that you'll also find on the website. So hopefully that gives you a good enough overview. And um, Tim, do you have um, some initial questions that come to mind? Yeah, I'd like to talk a little bit about the, the big picture. Um, I just learned something new, which is great, that you know only 10 million of your solar for all funding comes from uh, Fiji, basically, and that there's already that existing uh, structure to to fund solar for all. But uh, you know, given that we're going to get 2,800 megawatts in between now and say 2025, um, can you tell us what chunk of that is going to be solar for all? Well, I think that the number 2,800 megawatts um, comes from the adjustable block program. So, so um, it's really sort of a separate bucket um, than, than that 2,800. Um, and it's difficult because it's, we're not thinking of it in terms of megawatts because it really is a bucket of money. But similarly, um, you know, they're, they are broken down into different project types and different project sizes, for instance. So to, to nail down a specific number of megawatts that that's going to produce is difficult. That's why we're kind of working from the $30 million a year, knowing that the incentives are essentially, um, you know, are, they are very much higher than the adjustable block program. We'll see fewer megawatts or kilowatts per dollar. Um, so it's a fairly small program, and I, I don't even have a specific megawatt target in mind or that, that we have been quoting. Um, I think at one point when we um, did some of the initial strategizing with the IPA, we had talked about um, if, you know, if you thought about the average project size for a single family home or a multifamily home or a nonprofit or community solar, you can get a sense of how big these are. For instance, it could be three or four community solar projects a year if they're all close to two megawatts. That's, that's about as big as that bucket funds. Um, there may be between 50 and 100 nonprofit or multifamily projects each per year, depending on the size, and maybe 400 to 500 single family homes projects or, or small multifamily, um, depending on the size. But that's speculation based on what we think average size projects will be. Okay. And, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the very useful things that the IPA and uh, the, the Adjustable Block Program Administrator have done is published a program guide. Will a similar document be published by yourselves? Yes, so um, uh, absolutely. I think with the uh, launch of vendor registration, the draft guide will be um, published as well next week. So, and similarly to the way it was published with uh, the adjustable block program, um, because we're still a few months away from program launch, that initial draft guide will be a partial guide, but it'll provide enough about program overview and about the registration process uh, and criteria for vendors so, so we can start getting those vendors regist register. But then once the program launches, we will have a full program guide. And what I would also say is that there's a lot of uh, moving parts with Illinois Solar for All that, that don't exist with adjustable block programs. So it's the intention of our program design to provide a lot of other resources and, and kind of hands-on support from the administrator, both to the vendors uh, that are uh, registered with the program uh, like training materials and other resources and maps and tools we could talk about, um, but also uh, for the public, you know, like around job training or grassroots education, et cetera. So uh, I have a couple more questions, but the, our listeners should definitely queue up your questions into the app uh, or raise your hand and we can unmute you. Uh, but this is a great opportunity to, to uh, talk to Vito directly and um, you know, so thinking from a uh, 
project perspective, let's say you're working with a nonprofit who wants to do a solar project, uh, you know, behind the meter, 100 kW rooftop project. What, uh, can you walk us through what the evaluation process needs to be from the, from the project developer's perspective? Um, well, I think uh, there, there's a couple of things. And again, I'm going to re, re, re emphasize the point that because we are still a few months away, there are certainly a lot of questions that are not answered yet. Um, we had, if you, if you uh, have been a part of the stakeholder process up till now, um, you, you'll know that we've done, we've presented a number of things to the public and gotten feedback, including um, grassroots education, envir environmental justice communities, um, doing that, uh, determining environmental justice communities. There is actually a session today on um, program evaluation and third-party evaluator, and on Friday there's another session um, on job training. Another important one, or, or maybe a series of them, will happen um, mid-month, mid-February, around um, eligibility and project approval. So those are going to be some important uh, pieces that will answer a lot of these questions that will get presented to the public, we will get feedback, and incorporate that feedback into the sort of final decisions. But you specifically talked about, let's say, a 100 kilowatt behind the meter project. I believe it was, was you talking about a nonprofit or a public sector? Let's just, say non, let's just say nonprofit. Sure. So, I mean, there's a couple of different pieces there. In terms of the process itself, Solar for All is going to mirror the adjustable plaque program in most ways. So, for instance, um, it's not just mirroring, but we are working with the administrator for the adjustable block program to share data. Um, it's important to note as well that while Illinois Solar for All will approve projects and go through um, uh, similar processes for project approval, once they're approved, they actually go back to the adjustable block program for those contracts to get facilitated um, with, with the rec, uh, contract counterparties. But in terms of the overall process from the vendor perspective, it should be pretty close. For instance, right now, um, the adjustable block program uses a disclosure process, which again, they're launching tomorrow, but they require standard disclosures be used, and the vendor uh, will put information about the contract and the system design uh, up front, generate these disclosures and generate the first part of project approval, a conditional approval, um, we will follow that same exact process. There's a few additional pieces that are specific to Illinois Solar for All, like the minimum savings and no upfront cost requirements has to be part of that disclosure, and we have to be able to document that. And then, of course, there's also income verification, which isn't part of adjustable block, but has to happen up front. So all of that information about qualified uh, participants needs to be gathered and submitted up front for that first conditional approval. And how, On the back end, yep, go ahead. Um, so projects have to qualify as being in environmental justice communities. Let's define what an environmental justice community is as far as the program is concerned? Sure, so if you're talking specifically, there's no qualification, well, let's back up. If you're particularly talking about nonprofit um, and that qualification, there, there's that sub-program for nonprofit and public sector. I think um, important to note that this, uh, the criteria for uh, eligibility was presented in, um, a session on October 29th, I believe, no, November 29th, um, initially, but the formal um, eligibility will, will come in mid-February. So what we're talking about today is uh, what we are collectively going to propose to the public, um, but it is not the final eligibility. So for nonprofit and public sector, we, had, we, we are proposing that the, um, the entity that's getting the energy uh, it resides in either a low-income community or an environmental justice community. Um, 
Yeah, that's the first criteria. The other is, of course, that they, they are getting the load. Whether they own or rent, they, um, they are getting the benefits of the system, of the energy coming from the system, um, and see those same minimum savings and such. And then the other thing is they have to uh, be either a critical service provider, things like, um, uh, like hospitals, housing services. There's a list of critical service providers that we're suggesting. And a lot of these, this is in the plan if you want to see some specifics. Uh, but also if you're not a critical service provider, there's a path that these entities can qualify by um, showing community engagement so that other community organizations support um, the installation uh, on this institution. So it's a little bit more convoluted at, at, in that, in the sense that there's a lot more to do to qualify this, but that's true of a lot of Illinois Solar for All. And what I would remind folks for, for nonprofit and public sector is it's a small bucket of money, and it's intended to serve um, these specific communities. So, so narrowing that definition uh, is important. Does that help? And then, and then uh, the same for for community solar, right? There's 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 a requirement that the benefit the beneficiaries, so the subscribers to that project, are low income or EJ and environmental justice. Um, do do you have a succinct definition of of EJ for the program? That we, for, for, uh, I'm going to make a clarifying point and then I'll answer your question about how to determine EJ communities. The first is that while we're proposing for nonprofit public sector the idea that these facilities are located within low income environmental justice communities, that's the only place in Illinois Solar for All where there is a hard requirement to be in an EJ community. Qualification overall for residential households is based on income not on, on where they are. So if you're 80% uh, or less AMI, whatever your area median income is, you could be anywhere in the state. You don't need to be in a specific density community of low income. You don't need to be in an EJ community. If you qualify an income, you could be anywhere in the state. So that's the first thing that's important. Um, however, one of the ways, because we, we had talked about the idea that um, uh, or the adjustable block program is doing a lottery because they, you know, for instance, with community solar, there are far more projects in the interconnection queue than can be satisfied with the existing blocks for this, this cycle. So they had proposed a lottery system to uh, fulfill any block that is uh, oversubscribed. For Illinois Solar for All, uh, what, what we, we have not, we don't have a formal proposal yet that we're going to present to the public, and it's certainly not finalized. But we had talked about the idea that rather than have a lottery system, that the project would prioritize projects on any number of points, for instance, being located within an environmental justice community. So while there's no requirement at the participant level to be in those communities, projects could be prioritized or in any number of ways, being in a low income community, having a higher than uh, uh, higher job training, qualified trainees on the installation. So that could be how environmental justice impacts qualification specifically. What we will provide and is a map of an, an interactive map of environmental justice communities where you can look for specific, specific census blocks um, that are, are qualifying under the methodology that we proposed. There'll also be an address lookup tool so you can actually look up any address across the state and it'll tell you yes or no you're in an EJ community. Um, we did a session about a week and a half ago where we shared our proposed the environment, the environmental justice methodology. In fact, that was pretty much prescribed in the long-term plan um, with, with a few minor changes, um, or not necessarily changes from the plan, but um, interpretations of the methodology. We also proposed an approach for the a self-designation process where data may not be definitive. Um, you, 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 a community can self-identify uh, by going through a, a a standardized process. Um, 
That is still up for comments. The comments are due, I believe, February 7th. You can go to our website and find that original uh, presentation along with the session recording, and uh, it'll tell you how to submit comments. So that will, we'll get final comments on the 7th, and we will um, finalize that process um, certainly before program launch. We are looking to get our initial proposed EJ community tool up as a sort of draft tool to help people, and particularly vendors who are registering, understand um, how it works and, and where we're at right now with EJ communities, but that will certainly change um, or is likely to change based on feedback. So we have a question from one of the listeners. Uh, Jeff asks, will a nonprofit that serves low income and minority residents in a relatively affluent county where it is located and its um, clients do not all live in low income or minority census blocks have access to the ISFA benefits. So here we have a nonprofit that's serving low income communities and, and uh, participants, so to speak, in their program, but they themselves are not necessarily embedded in a low income community. Would a, would a, would a nonprofit like that be eligible? In, in uh, the, what we had proposed and I, I shared a few minutes ago, that definition would not include an organization like that because they're not, the facility that is uh, taking the energy is not within a low income or environmental justice community. Okay. Um, however, all of the people they work with would, would qualify. So their constituents still qualify regardless of where they live based on their income. Sure. So if I'm a solar installer looking at commercial, uh, industrial, behind the meter projects for local governments and nonprofits, uh, I need to be very careful about the geography, the location of those entities physically, right? But there's also... Um, there's also some training requirements. Can you talk to that specifically on, on projects? Sure. Um, there was another, ses another session this Friday on job training requirements. It's a webinar. There's also an in-person component. You can do either or. They're simultaneous. So I encourage you to take part in that because there's a lot of details that will be hard to cover here. But broadly speaking, um, the um, legislation calls for a portion of the hours work on, on all in Illinois solar for all installations be done by qualified trainees. Um, and what that means is there are, first of all, FIJA had three buckets of training programs that were funded. One was the solar pipeline program um, which trains installers and, 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 and installer contractors um, for solar installation. And there is a uh, craft apprenticeship program, which is administered by uh, IDEW, which is um, training um, sort of the next generation electricians for solar installation. There's another one called the Multicultural Program, which is a bucket of, I think, six different programs. Um, and, and all of these programs, I want to say there's 12 to 15 different training programs across the state. All of the trainees that come from them are qualified trainees. So there's, there's also a way that other programs, for instance, that lead to NABCEP certification or uh, elect electrician certification or journeyman certification um, will also qualify as long as they were in Illinois. Um, but all these programs produce these qualified graduates. And what the program says, the way the, the long-term plan interpreted it was to say, um, all Illinois Solar for All projects by any given uh, a vendor, approved vendor must have a certain percentage of hours performed by these qualified graduates. That number increases every year. So for instance, in the first year, it's 20%. In the second year, I mean, excuse me, in the first year, it's 10%. In the second year, it's 20%. In the third year, it's 
of all installation hours are performed by these qualified trainees. We recognize also that uh, these approved vendors may be working with subcontractors, then those subcontractors can, can have those trainees on staff and, and qualify that project. There's another specific requirement for DG. So for residential DG projects, um, it is at least one trainee needs to be on 33% of the project. So uh, these are not insignificant amounts of hours, and, and it's a lot of details. So again, I would encourage you to, uh, at the very least, look at the materials for the session on Friday if you can't join, or go back and watch the video later if you have questions about the specifics. Okay, yeah, there's a lot to uh, digest there, and um, I guess that is generally a uh, a concern that that we have certainly here at Continental is that the that the requirements are uh, just administratively very onerous. How do we how do we transcend that and make it practical to really serve the the demand, which is abundant? You know, there's there's plenty of nonprofits and local governments that want to do solar projects, but from from then the installer's perspective to guarantee that they can meet all of those rigorous requirements. Um, do you have any thoughts about that? Um, so I, I'm assuming, Tim, you're talking about by, over and above the job training or, or specific to job training? Well, including the job training, I mean, um, yeah. finding, finding those trainees. Uh, I mean, I'm glad you mentioned the IBEW program. We are an IBEW uh, contractor and and I know local 134 has been running a program uh, led by Harry Odie and we're grateful for that uh, the number of trainees being produced by that program though is pretty small is my understanding it's it's uh, you know it's on the order of maybe a few dozen um, and you think of Illinois it's a very very big state uh, those right. those trainees get spread out and, and employed very quickly. It's true. I think that um, part of the planning was that those programs launched before Solar for All um, so that you can have, you know, a good year of, of um, producing these qualified trainees. Um, so you'll see multiple cohorts coming from these programs before Illinois Solar for All launches. Um, and, you know, with the 12 to 15 programs, we're hoping that there is um, a significant pool of qualified trainees coming from these FIJA programs. There is also, again, a provision where other programs outside of these FIJA programs would, would meet the qualification. Um, and again, there, there, there's, there's a fair amount of details, but for instance, those programs that lead to certification of NAPSEP, um, would be qualified if they happened in Illinois. Electrical journeymen, and there's other community college programs that can qualify. So um, you can look at specifics um, for those categories of other qualified job training programs because that opens up the pool significantly. Um, I, and I mean, there's a concern that, you know, that, that the sheer number of graduates that come from these programs may not be enough, but there's also the geography and that these programs are not in every corner of the state. Um, you know, and, and, and while installer contractors can kind of cover a fairly wide territory, there are certainly going to be gaps and, and we're concerned about that and watching it closely. But between allowing for these other programs, um, uh, and, and then, uh, and, and then also uh, allowing waivers um, for that requirement when it's justified. We're trying to make it so it's not impossible or not too onerous. Uh, we haven't figured out what that uh, that waiver process is, but I think we'd certainly be considering that if it truly is impossible to meet these requirements um, or too burdensome, that that a, a waiver could be the right thing to do. Um, but we would, we would also think about how 
that may be a uh, it, it, we're thinking about some sort of restrictions on how to do how and when to do a waiver. For instance, if there's no training program within 100 miles of a site that <clears throat> the bar is significantly lower for qualifying for a waiver than if you're in you know the Chicago metro area and there's there's six programs available and a couple hundred trainees. Um, but I get that. I think there there are a lot of there there are a lot of challenges. But I think these incentives in many cases are two or three times what you're getting for the adjustable block program. Um, and 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 there are a lot of unique um, barriers and needs in these communities. And 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 those consumer protections and those requirements are important. And for those who are familiar with, for instance, energy efficiency programs and the, the income eligible energy efficiency programs, um, those requirements uh, are, are important and they work. Sure. Yeah, I just want to um, wrap up by saying, you know, this is a program that is designed to ensure that the incentives related to FIJA do get distributed around the state and that uh, low income communities benefit just as much as everybody else. You know, the, the, the hard fact is that solar is an expensive, relatively expensive technology still for the everyday consumer. And so it is, it is very important that there are these, uh, this, this program, the Solar for All program. And we look forward to seeing the guidebook. Remind us, Vito, when will the guidebook be published or when is it anticipated? Um, if I can, Tim, I'll share a couple of key milestones here. Okay, So, um, again, today, actually, at uh, 2 o'clock, there's a webinar on program evaluation and third-party evaluators. Friday at 2 o'clock, there's a um, session on job training requirements. These are webinars. Friday is actually an in-person and a webinar. Um, next week, we will be launching the vendor registration um, for Illinois Solar for All, and we will have a partial or draft manual available then that'll help uh, provide a program overview and how to register and all of that. Um, otherwise, the program launches in April, targeting the beginning of April, and we'll have a full manual or guidebook uh, available before launch. Um, we'll also be expanding the website um, uh, significantly with next week's launch. Uh, and I would also say look in mid-February for a session or multiple sessions on eligibility and project approval requirements, which are going to be pretty important pieces. Okay. We have one straggler question, and then I'm going to go to uh, announcements, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, the listener asks, <clears throat> can developers claim the benefits from the Solar for All program on residential PPA arrangements? Um, yes, PPAs um, are, are uh, you know, a, 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 will work fine. I mean, I think uh, like the adjustable block program, um, PPA system owner uh, ownership models, even lease models can work as long as the um, the the um, homeowner or the participant sees a, a, a savings threshold of 50%. And remember, the incentives are increased to include that 50% savings. Um, so it'll work. And with the PPA, meeting the no upfront cost payments is, is a lot easier as well. Okay, good. Well, thanks everybody for your questions and for attending today. I want to make a few upcoming announcements. Um, we have on February 26th, Everything you wanted to know about our net zero future with Kathy Higgins of the New Building Institute. New Building Institute is focused on net zero construction for the commercial marketplace. And then in March, on March 26th, we'll have a program on zero energy homes coming soon to a neighborhood near you. And that's with the Net Zero Energy Coalition. So looking forward to uh, giving our audience more content on net zero, which of course is the foundation um, for solar ready facilities 
And uh, so solar is a big part of that as well. With that, I want to thank our, <clears throat> our guest speaker, Vito Greco of Elevate Energy. Thank you so much for making time for us today, Vito. And please, uh, to everybody out there, go to IllinoisSFA.com and learn about the program and sign up for updates. With that, thank you very much, and we'll see you next month.